William Dr. William Sandy Darity Jr. is an award-winning, highly respected ec economist, known for his work on economic disparity, reparations, and inequality, particularly with the African-American community. We're humbled to have Dr. Darity back for a fourth appearance on this channel. Ladies and gentlemen, family, Dr. Darity. How you doing, Dr. Darity? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on your program again. Well, it's actually definitely positively, this is our, our pleasure to have you back, sir. Um, I'd like to jump in with some stuff. I, I want to first uh, apologize for the uh, lateness. Using this new application was a little difficult, but I'm glad you made time for us. And yes, it's doing as it should do. Right now it sees me, but when you talk, it'll see you. Folks, I'm getting the kinks out of this software. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Darity, can I open up the floor by asking you about the California Reparations Program? I know they have a California task force. Um, I'm pretty sure you're aware of what's going on with it. Do you have any thoughts about the, the efficacy of, of that task force and how it relates to uh, African-Americans, the descendants of the formerly enslaved? Well, uh, let me say, I not yet in a position to talk completely freely about it. Um, I'm one of the members with with my with my partner Kirsten Mullen of the the team that was put together to try to provide advice to the task force or suggestions to the task force about ways in which they could calculate the size of the reparations bill in California. Uh, and we told them at the outset that the state was not going to be capable of funding a program that would be sufficient to eliminate the racial wealth gap for the black residents of California who would be eligible for their uh, for their project. So uh, so they went in a different direction. Um, and I think it's the only other direction they could have gone in. Uh, because there's a set of problems associated with attempting to do reparations at the state or local level that are are, are quite daunting. But um, they chose instead to try to identify a set of harms and damages that had been incurred on Black people or imposed on Black people in California, uh, and then trying tried to identify sums of money that could be associated with each of those categories of harm that could be treated as compensation. Uh, now, that's uh, perhaps the only alternative, but it's, it's a problem also. If you enumerate all of the harms sufficiently, and if you're able to obtain the data to uh, document all of those harms sufficiently, which is, which is a serious issue, uh, and if you are to re uh, if you are to pay reparations to everyone who should receive reparations, uh, then you end up by using this enumeration strategy with perhaps at least as large a bill as you would be required to meet if you uh, attempted to just eliminate the racial wealth gap. And so, um, so there's there's a very difficult issue that they've been confronted with in terms of what type of proposal do they present to the California State Assembly that not only will make some serious headway in terms of addressing the damages that have been done, but also will be feasible to fund. Uh, and I'm not sure what answer they really are going to come up with because their final meeting is is in a few days this month. And uh, and that's when the, the the task force will finally approve the full proposal so that they're going to put forward to the state assembly. Fantastic! Uh, thank you so much for sharing that information. I was I was looking into it, and I wanted to communicate to the audience so that they're aware. California was not a slave state, and according to my research, what happened was there were a number of African Americans who were freed that came to California. And they were able to purchase land. Of course, Dr. Dirty, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. They, they purchased land and other things. And subsequently, the state of California removed them of their property, removed them of their personal goods, their, their, uh, uh, their homes and their land. And so in this, so their situation is a little bit different than maybe some other states. Um, 
It well, becomes more complex. Yeah, maybe yes, I mean, I mean, I don't think I don't think you could set as a priority for looking at the California case slavery per se, but there was slavery practiced in California, particularly during the period of the gold rush, where Southern slaveholders came to California to try to get gold, and they brought their enslaved human property with them. And so I think estimates run in the vicinity of saying that by 1852 or so, uh, there probably were approximately 2,000 enslaved Black people in California. So it's, it's not quite accurate to say that there was no slavery in California, but it wasn't practiced on the scale of the states that formed the Confederacy by any means. Um, and so if we're talking about harms and damages in California, uh, well, I would argue that you probably have to think about it in a similar way in other places if you're going to go the harms and damages route. But if you're going the harms and damages route in California, you have to think about atrocities that took place afterwards, including the appropriation and seizure of land and other property that was held by Black folks in the state. It sounds like a unique precedent could be set here with us extending the conversation beyond just slavery, which is where many people, when they have their rebuttals to our arguments, seem to want to play in that particular area. Um, and if we can move the conversation into other damages beyond slavery, which is something you spoke very, you know, very uh, deeply with in your book, um, from here to eternity, equality, equality. That's it. From yeah. here to equality. So, uh, do do you see that as a I don't know. Do do you see there's a possible win? Um, I know we're a long way out. I, I, I well, I, I, th I think I think one of the most important contributions from the California Task Force is not necessarily the package of recommendations that they will give to the state assembly, but during the first year of their uh, proceedings, they generated an interim report, which is a superb study of the history of what happened to Black Americans, not just in California, but across the country, not only during the period of enslavement, but more significantly in some ways during the period after. And I think that that report is something that should be mandatory reading uh, for all Americans. It's as significant as the Kerner Commission report of 1968. Uh, and I think that that is the legacy of this commission that could have a tremendous amount of impact nationwide. That is amazing. That is, does, does in, your, in your view, Dr. Darity, does that get us beyond this hump of we need to do a study? We need to do a study, Tim Black. We need to study this. What's the study? Tell us. Let's do another. Can Can we... Can we use that the data that's in, you know in this report um, to to sort of move that to move us along down that road? It's saying, okay, we got a study. Here's a study done in California for California. the whole country, and, and it's for the whole country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes, I mean, I I think we have been in a position to actually write a federal uh, reparations plan for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the we we have a lot of information about what should go into such a plan. Um, and and interestingly enough, recently, um, Kirsten and I testified before the city council in Washington, D.C., where they are putting together some type of a task force. And, and we argued that that's an instance in which a local reparations plan makes a tremendous amount of sense because the district is under federal authority. Mm. And so a reparations plan for the district could be funded directly by the federal government. Wow. And that could set a precedent for a national program of reparations to be conducted by the federal government. So uh, we're, we're very interested in trying to see what will happen in the DC case. Because uh, you 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 know probably you 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 do know that D.C. was the only site in the United States where 
slave owners were compensated for their emancipated human property. Uh, and, and Lincoln was expecting that to be a precedent that could be followed throughout the country so that you could terminate the Civil War and, and, and reduce the level of blood loss and, and simultaneously in slavery. Well, no other states followed suit. It was only in DC. So the precedent setting didn't occur in that case, but it would be, I think, a delicious irony if the District of Columbia set the precedent for the entire country for reparations. Wow, okay, okay. And that's, that's sort of my backyard, I'm in Maryland, so. I would okay. be very much, yeah, very much. I'm yeah. sorry I missed you when you came to D.C. with uh, uh, Miss Kirsten Mullins. I'm sorry I missed you guys when you came through. Um, is there anything else on California reparations? I know that there are a number of people who are very much anticipating the results of this. Um, they, they People are saying, hey, I need to move to California. I'm like, there are prerequisites to, the, to being qualified for California reparations, if they do well, happen, yeah, to come and, to pass. and the task force report is is merely a set of recommendations to the state assembly. So it's the state assembly that has to enact whatever type of plan is conducted in in California. And I, at you know at the moment, I have no idea what kind of response the state assembly will provide. There are a couple of state assembly representatives on the task force, uh, but I have no idea whether or not their point of view is a dominant point of view in the state assembly. Uh, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. To it. Uh, also, anytime you have a reparations plan that is localized or decentralized in this in this way, then there have there they have to impose residency requirements which is something that doesn't have to occur with a national program. So, nice. you know, folks cannot just move to California and be eligible for reparations the way in which the plan is constructed in the present moment. So, yeah, st stay where you are, fight for federal reparations. <laughs> right, right. And then, and then understandable. Um, so that moves us on to the next topic. And look, folks, Dr. Darity. He gave a, a very dynamic talk at the UMass Amherst uh, event. And the title of it was, um, gosh, please forgive me here. I had to look it up earlier when I was telling. Does everyone lose from racism? Does everyone lose from racism? It's on YouTube. And it's, it's, been, a, it's, it's been the uh, focal point, something I've been watching. I watched it a couple of times. And it's so pointed, uh, Dr. Darity, because there's been this conversation online, particularly on the right with certain figures, such as Matt Walsh, um, Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, that somehow white Americans are more impacted by racism now than black Americans. And your, your speech, your, your, your talk, it wasn't really a speech because you interacted, you took questions, um, it spoke directly to that. Could, could you go into a little bit about uh, that that talk and how it pertains to that assertion that white Americans are somehow more damaged by racism today. Yeah, so 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 it's it's interesting uh, because the folks on the right say racism hurts white Americans more than it hurts Black Americans. The folks on the left say, well, they don't say it hurts white Americans more, but they say it does hurt white Americans. And so we could be better off if we got rid of racism because everybody would be better off. Well, I certainly think that uh, we would be better off if there was no racism, but I'm not convinced that everyone would benefit from a world in which there was no racism given the advantages that so many segments of the white community continue continue to obtain from the uh, from the operation of white supremacy and, and that was the point I was trying to make that, that both both right and left are wrong on this one um, now the fact that they're both wrong makes it more difficult to figure out how you can really get rid of racism because if you have a significant segment of your population that benefits from it, well, then 
obviously it's going to be difficult for them to surrender the privileges and advantages that are associated with being on top of the heap in a uh, in a society that's stratified by race. Which is, um, which to me is a very fundamental thing. I want to back up and just say, I appreciate you bringing up how this is not just a right conversation about the right saying, well, we have this thing called reverse racism. It's just racism. But mm -hmm. also pointing out that the left in their, in their deduction of well, you know, white people suffer too. As it seems like a way to kind of they're trying to back into dealing with the issue, which is racism itself. It's like, well, we want to we want to make, make white people well, know that they got it, some skin it, it in the almost game. implies that folks who are uh, are benefiting from racism are stupid, because if in fact they're not benefiting from racism, why do they continue to maintain a a social structure that produces it. And, and I'm, I'm saying that we have a more serious problem. They actually do benefit. They benefit both in relative and absolute terms. And as a consequence, it is going to be more difficult to dismantle this type of a system. Uh, and we'll have to identify and give support to those white folks who are defectors. Uh, and and defection will be very very important in this context uh you know for us to be able to have the political movement that would produce a reparations plan for black american descendants of u.s slavery would require if you're going to do it legislatively it would require a significant amount of support from white americans and uh that means that some of them are going to have to give up some of the benefits material benefits that they get from the existing order. Dr. Darity, what are some of the material benefits that some white Americans are benefiting from racism without even knowing it? Because often they say, hey, I'm not, I'm not a racist. I don't benefit from this stuff. I don't have money. I'm not rich. I live pay to, paycheck to paycheck. How else are they benefiting other than, um, yeah. How else so are they so the, the key thing is we got to make a comparison between the conditions that face most white Americans versus the conditions that face most black Americans. So let's start with an obvious one, differential treatment by the police and the criminal justice system. Okay, so there's one area of marked advantage. Uh, second area is health outcomes in this country. Uh, the most highly educated black women, black women with professional degrees and PhDs and the equivalent, have the highest infant mortality rates among all women in the United States, including black women who are not as well educated. And so, uh, and then of course, the black infant mortality rate across all women is at least twice as high as the white infant mortality rate. And we could go through a list of health outcomes and we'd find that white folks, uh, even white folks whose incomes are relatively low, have better health outcomes. Uh, let's consider wealth. So your wealth is heavily concentrated. The biggest disparities in wealth are attributable to the position of folks who are in the upper half or upper quarter of the wealth distribution. But if you go to the poorest quintile, the lowest 20% of income recipients in the United States, white Americans have a median net worth of about $15,000, and Black Americans have a median net worth that is close to zero. So these are two groups in the same income category, but there is, there is a cushion of wealth that's even possessed by the poorest of white Americans that is not possessed by, by any black Americans. If we think about employment, you know, the classic observation is that the unemployment rate for blacks is two times as high as the unemployment rate for whites. I think that's a very significant, uh, significant indicator of discrimination, but it also suggests that there are certain advantages that all white Americans have in the labor market. And, you know, I could I could go on. 
But I think that that's the, the, these examples make the point that there is a difference in treatment. There is a difference in economic security. There's a difference in opportunity that is racialized in the society. And it gives whites a relative advantage and in many instances, an absolute advantage over black Americans. During your talk, Dr. Dirty, one of the audience members asked you a question. And I think it was on the topic of closing the racial wealth gap. And in, the, in your response, you brought up, and I wanna get this right, you said black wealth can grow and white wealth White wealth would need to grow not as much. So there are different ways to bring down, to close the racial wealth gap, but they require yeah. certain conditions. That's what it was. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and when I look at policies, I'm sure if you could expand on that, but as we look at policies, I don't hear it explained this way. Folks, listen to Dr. Dirty as he explains what you have to do if you want to close the racial wealth gap. It's really simple. So there's, there's a handful of scenarios. One scenario, if you want to close the racial wealth gap, is you raise white wealth and you raise black wealth, but you raise black wealth more proportionately, okay? Uh, a second scenario is you lower the wealth for both groups, but you lower white wealth more proportionately. And then the third scenario is you raise black wealth and you lower white wealth. Okay, so those are the, the, the three circumstances in which you can alter the black-white ratio and wealth in such a way that you raise the black ratio. Uh, the, the way in which you, you know, the, this process of lowering wealth for everybody doesn't sound particularly attractive to me. Uh, I think lowering wealth for whites and raising wealth for blacks uh, would produce even more hostility than the third option, which is to have both groups' wealth increase, but have black wealth increase more. Or, you know, you could more conservatively not change white wealth much and raise black wealth. Yeah, that's and, really and the that, most that's that's <laughs> essentially the premise behind a reparations project that would eliminate the racial wealth gap. That's also where it seems where we get the most resistance. That's yeah, well, I, I think you get the most resistance if you were be, if you were to drive down white wealth oh, while cool. you're raising black wealth. Okay, well, but yeah. yes, I mean you're right. There, there, there was resistance on all of those polls uh, because you would be improving the relative position of black Americans, and that is uh, something that is anathema to many white Americans. Dr. Darity, when people are having these conversations about different policy points, I've seen you go back and forth with people on Twitter about, for instance, erasing student debt or eliminating it or reduce, getting rid of some of it of 50,000, I think it was a number they put out there. Joe Biden ended up saying it'll be 10 or I don't know. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. You've been having to respond to those critiques. Um, I guess this is your way of saying this is it's pretty simple. If the policy does not increase black wealth, uh, what are we even talking about? If if it's so, well, so, no, I, I, I I'm perfectly uh, I'm perfectly fine with the idea of canceling student debt. Sure, uh, you know that that's a good idea. There's a number of things that are good ideas that would not necessarily have a significant effect on the racial wealth gap. Uh, one of my colleagues is a, is an expert on student on student debt, Finaba Adu, and mm -hmm. we've done a couple of papers together, and uh, and it's pretty clear that if you were to uh, eliminate student debt and perhaps simultaneously uh, eliminate tuition at state supported institutions, this would this would boost uh, black access to higher education. Now, no question about that. But would it have much of an effect on the racial wealth gap? Well, I would argue no, for two big reasons. The first is, despite the fact that Black Americans have higher levels of student debt, Black Americans actually have a lower level of overall debt than white Americans. And so the reason you have the racial wealth gap is because of the difference in assets, not the difference in indebtedness. And that asset gap is so substantial 
that that it overwhelms the fact that whites actually have a higher average overall level of indebtedness. The other thing that you can also point out is that when you look at whites who might have high levels of debt, but also high levels of assets, the type of debt that they possess might be of the sort that permits them to accumulate more assets in the future. So, for example, if you have an ongoing business and you want to expand it and you take out a business loan, to the extent that you're successful in expanding your business, that indebtedness actually produced an asset or an asset growth at a later point in time. And I think whites are more likely to have those types of forms of debt because they have more resources in the first place. So, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's one reason. Um, the, the second reason is, uh, so black folks get more access to education, higher levels of educational attainment across the black community. That doesn't mean that it's gonna translate into significantly higher levels of wealth. Right. Uh, we know that black heads of household with a college degree, have two thirds of the net worth of white heads of household who never finished high school. So, uh, and and this is because of intergenerational transmission of resources. Uh, you know, you can be a highly educated black person, but you're probably going to get much less of a transfer of resources from your parents and grandparents than a relatively uh, less well-educated white person. So. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think student debt cancellation is a terrific idea, but I think we have to be we have to be temperate about what we claim to be the consequences of these kinds of policies. You know, I, there was a time when I had to be educated on this, and I think the second time you came on the show, you brought me up to speed on it. I think some people say hearts are in the right place and they're trying to sell this idea. And of course there are people who would benefit from it, but so like there are certain certain types of exercises that will benefit you in certain ways, be good for your health overall, but they might not give you abs. And <laughs> yeah, and you, I, I mean, I'm afraid there's nothing's gonna give me abs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? So yeah, the, I, the, the promise yeah. That, <laughs> I will never have a six pack. No. <laughs> I, I don't think. I, I, look, I'm in the, I'm in the same boat with you. But, or hair? I won't have hair. At least you have hair, sir. <laughs> um, but yeah, just don't use our racial wealth gap as the as the uh, driving force in, in your selling of this of this policy. You know, the, no, because it's just no. not true. Yeah, you can yeah. go for walks, and that's great for your legs, but it's not gonna you know, it's not gonna give it a diabetes. Like so, no. so there's other things, there's other steps we need to take, and we got to deal with that. I think we got to deal with that and say it plainly if we want to get a coalition built around it. Um. You talked about three different programs, and this is just for folks who may not be aware. Dr. Dirty has so much information, I gotta give it to you. There are three different programs that were given to white Americans that were not given to black Americans, at least not at rates that would impact us in a racial yeah. wealth gap or that helped create the racial wealth gap. Dr. Dirty, could you speak to those three particular actions? Well, there, there's more than three, but the three that we've highlighted in the work that we've done are the following. The Homestead Act, the New Deal, and the GI Bill. And uh, the Homestead Act was a land distribution policy that was in, instituted in the United States. It, the legislation was first adopted in 1862 during the midst of the Civil War. And uh, it provided 160 acre land grants to, uh, to recipients uh, in the Western territories as the nation completed its colonial settler project. So this is land that uh, was was a territory that was under Native American possession initially. And um, and the federal government essentially distributed uh, 270 million acres of land to one and a half million white families. Now, if you if you say conservatively that a family had four members, uh, when in fact, in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, families were larger. But let, let's be conservative. So that would constitute about 6 million people who were 
recipients of these uh, of these these land patents, and that would be somewhere in the vicinity of ten to twelve percent of the white population in America around uh, around the turn of the previous century. Okay, so that, that's that's a substantial yes. government handout, if you will. So, at the same time, the federal government had promised black Americans who had been enslaved in the United States, 40 acre land grants. So one quarter of the size that was given to white Americans under the Homestead Act. Now that promise wasn't kept. There were a few black Americans who did receive land patents, some under the Homestead Act of 1862 itself, primarily in Kansas, and others under the Southern Homestead Act, which actually lasted less than a decade. I estimate that the total of number of people who were Black who got these types of land grants might have been about 10,000 persons. Mm. And that's less than 1% of the 4 million Black people who were emancipated at the end of the Civil War. So there's a vast difference in this allocation of land. Um, then the second policy that I mentioned is the New Deal arrangements, which were designed to exclude Blacks from having full benefits. And the tactic that was used to do that was to exclude folks who were farm employees and domestic laborers. But the other thing that was built into the New Deal legislation was the foundation for the redlining project which essentially starved Black Americans from access to credit that would have allowed them to, uh, to purchase homes in any location that they so desired. And then the third policy that's relevant here is also connected to home ownership, and that's the GI Bill, which had provisions to support home buying for the returning veterans. And those provisions were executed in a highly discriminatory fashion, so much so that there was a very small minority of the Black returning veterans who got any significant benefit from that. But the white returning veterans uh, received such substantial benefits that this was the foundation for the white middle class that emerged after World War II. I just found it necessary to remind folks and, and to educate those people who may not, have heard, may not have heard of this, that we didn't just wake up one day in the year 2023, that it does matter, lineage does matter, and it does matter uh, that folks were given land, whether it be a, you know 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Where'd the land right. go? Land doesn't just disappear. It's still land. Yes. Whether it's in your family, and you, now, you could have you could have sold it, but yeah, yeah. then that would give you money also. Uh, I think the that Trina Shanks Williams at the University of Michigan estimates that there are at least forty five million living white Americans who continue to be beneficiaries of the Homestead Act land patents. I wonder how many living African Americans or Black Americans. Um, are, are, are beneficiaries of that two percent that you estimated hmm. in the home? Well, I guess I, I, I guess one of them is Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, go Whoopi! 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 You know, Whoopi is on, on TV saying you know that the black folks got these land grants. Well, yeah. no, a very small number did, and I think her family was among those. But that gave her the false impression that it had happened for everybody. Mm. Well, Whoopi's, Whoopi, uh, yeah, she's got different lineage. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Um, a, a couple a couple questions here. Um, on the topic of reparations, because that's where we are, as a vocal advocate for reparations, can you discuss some misconceptions about reparations and explain how they could work on a more practical level. I hear it all the time. How can we do it? How can we pay it? I would really love to help out the Blacks, but I just don't. How could we? How, what does that look like, Tim Black? As if I'm an economist. Well, I have an economist, Dr. Darity. Maybe what would you say, Dr. Darity? Well, let, let, me, let me make a, a, a pitch first, which is to say that, uh, you know, Kirsten and I tried to answer 
these kinds of logistical concerns in the last chapter of our book, From Here to Equality. But also, uh, subsequently, there was a, a group of scholars that came together that we call the Reparations Planning Committee. And they have produced a report that is published now in a volume that is called The Black Reparations Project, A Handbook for Racial Justice, mm. where the entire book is devoted to trying to sort out how you could do a reparations plan most effectively. So there's a couple of places where these logistical questions are that are, are attempted to be answered. Uh, and so I would, you know, urge folks who are really curious. And I think there's some black folks who say, how would we do it too? Sure. So I would urge folks who are curious to please look at those. Uh, but I'd be glad to try to answer any kind of specific puzzles folks might have, puzzles that you frequently hear, for example, Tim. Well, specifically, it's, um, you know, well, was this going to be just cash or is this going to be in the form of land? What about just letting black folks go to school? Maybe, and would you really already answered that question because that's not a, those outcomes don't necessarily mean wealth for those black Americans, even if they do have degrees. So you already answered that, but those yeah. are typically what I get, you know, cash, you know, where are we going to get the cash from? And also, um, could, could that also be in payments as opposed to a, a lump sum and including land or other policies? So my feeling is that uh, money gives you the greatest degree of flexibility. So if there are people who want to purchase land or even, I mean, some of the folks who who label themselves as Pan-Africanists, and I think there's multiple meanings to that, but there are some who say that their objective is to repatriate to the continent. Mm. Well, my feeling is every eligible recipient should get money and not necessarily as cash. I'll come to that in a moment. But they should they should receive money and they should have full discretion over how it's used. And so if they want to purchase land, by all means, do so. If they want to go back to Africa, even though they've never probably been before, they can do that. So uh, so I think it's a it's a matter of giving people flexibility. And as a consequence, you want to give them the monetary payment. Now, the monetary payment does not necessarily have to be outright cash transfers. You could give people a financial asset that would be, well, we say it's less liquid. It simply means that the form it takes, you could not spend the full amount right away. So it could be an annuity or it could be a trust account or it could be some type of an endowment. Uh, but the key point is that the individual recipient should have full authority over how the funds are used. So, uh, so, so that's my response. Yes, it should be money, a monetary payment. It could take a variety of forms, uh, but that's that's what I see as the priority. And let folks use the funds as they see fit, and you know they can purchase whatever type of asset they really like. So, uh, so that that that's that's my sense. Uh, you know, personally, I don't want a plot of land right now, but I other people might. Well, if we each had a a a sum of money from a reparations project, we could choose what to do with it. Could go out and buy that land if that's what you want. Go buy it on the yeah. free market, right? Yeah. Um, I think some people, and of course, this is just my commentary. Uh, I think some people just don't want to say it. They don't want to say it out loud to white folks that we want money, but in America, that's how we solve problems. We can't, you know, we, we can't give people back their time, their life, their freedom. No. We give them money and compensation. That's what we right. do in America. We do it all the time. We do it with, we do it all the time, all the time, but it's just a problem because it's yeah. uh, black folks. I mean, the federal government has done that for people who have had, uh, uh, vaccination damages. Uh, they've done it for certain kinds of environmental harms. 
They did it for Japanese Americans who were subjected to mass incarceration during World War II. They've done it for uh, American citizens who were victims of the Holocaust. They've yes. supplemented the payments that the German government has made. Uh, they've done it for uh, the folks who who the, fer- the the U.S. government was not necessarily responsible for the for the for the atrocity. So you know the the nine one one the families that lost uh, the lost lost uh, lost loved ones during nine eleven. The right. federal government has provided compensation for those families. The individuals who were taken hostage in Iran at the uh, the last phase of Jimmy Carter's presidency. Ayatollah, yes. Yeah, by the Ayatollah Khomeini. That's right. Mm-hmm. They have been they have been uh, awarded reparations, and and you might be interested to know what the amount is. per day of captivity. The average hostage was held for 440 days. So that's $4.4 million. Suddenly, Dr. Darity's figures and amounts don't sound so crazy, do they? No. Uh, uh, no, Some people really get upset with me because it sounds like my numbers are are too small. Um, (laughs) And... I'm all about getting more. So <laughs> right. if folks can justify larger amounts, <laughs> I'm all for it. There, there's a uh, conservative, and as you pointed out, this is not just something that uh, white Americans are pushing back on. It's also ideological. Um, we have conservatives who are black who, who push back on this as well. I've, I've, uh, Senator Tim Scott is one of those folks that says that he doesn't believe in systemic racism. America's not a racist country. We got one uh, person who I think his name is Coleman something. He's a conservative, a a black conservative. And he says he agrees with reparations, Dr. Darity, but if you go back a couple, if you go back past grandfathers and grandmothers, then it gets a little murky, and that's where he has a problem. It should be a cutoff for people being compensated for reparations beyond the life of the grandparents. Uh, What would your response to that be? Well, I've actually heard him say that he actually agrees that reparations are due for redlining. Oh, okay. So it it seems like the position he's at, this is Coleman Hughes. That's it. I, I think the position he's at now is he's saying that if there was some form of victimization that occurred directly for the individual's who are being considered for reparations, he would agree with that being a, a, reason, a valid reason for compensation. Well, so if you think about it, the case that, that uh, Kirsten and I've been making about reparations is we've been arguing that the racial wealth gap captures the cumulative intergenerational effects of white racism on living Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. So from our perspective, the racial wealth gap is a measure of the current ongoing damages to the folks who are alive now. And if Coleman Hughes's view is that it has to be some form of direct harm that is being compensated, well, from our point of view, there it is. There's the direct harm. Now, there's another approach that I'm becoming increasingly intrigued by, which is to say that reparations, the general reparations for all Black Americans might be predicated on the difference in longevity between Black and white Americans. Wow. Now, you could compensate people for the difference in uh, lifespan average lifespan. And uh, and that difference is somewhere in the vicinity of five to six years. And uh, if you were to use something like the statistical value of a human life, which is now at least estimated to be about $10 million, then you could divide uh, the lifespan of the average lifespan of a black American into that number and generate a figure for the value of each year. Multiply that by five and you'll come up with a figure that's somewhere in the vicinity of seven hundred three to seven hundred four thousand dollars. And if you 
then multiply that across the eligible Black American recipients of reparations, it will give you a total of about $29 trillion, somewhere in there. So that's more than the estimate that Kirsten and I have been working with based upon the racial wealth gap. So you could use the racial longevity gap and you could end up with a figure that's even higher, but I think it's a, a figure that has a justification. You know, when we had conversations, like, and thank you so much for that. When we had these conversations, people always walk away wondering what can they do? Um, we have to do more than just talk on Twitter about it and put out content about it on YouTube. What would be some suggestions you have, Dr. Darity, for folks that want to be active in this, who want to help this process along, but just don't know how to get started? Yeah, I, I think that we have to come together within the Black community around a consistent and coherent plan for reparations, and then work to pursue the full development of a social movement to make Congress do the right thing. And that would include electing a different array of people to Congress. Um, you know, I think that that that's critical. I mean, the existing Congress is not going to pass a reparations plan, no. and so uh, you know, we we have to try to have people in place in Congress who would vote for a comprehensive reparations plan. Uh, but we first have to come to some agreement over what that plan should look like so that we can be in the process, uh, be about the process of, of, of making a coherent plan happen. And uh, there's lots of disagreements within the Black community over what the plan should look like, particularly over the eligibility issue. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, which, you know, I, I'm actually surprised that eligibility is controversial. Uh, <laughs> You know, some some 20 years ago, when I uh, worked on a paper with Dania Francis, uh, we introduced a particular set of eligibility criteria that seemed pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, Kirsten actually came up with the the second branch of it, but uh, but the idea was that you would need to have not just the lineage standard, but also what we now refer to as an identity standard. Mm. So an individual would have to uh, establish that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. Now, there's a group of folks who say, anybody who is Black in the United States should get reparations. Mm. Well, I think that that denies the historical context of what has produced the current racial wealth gap and the historical context and, and to whom it applies. And so there's a certain historical specificity that's relevant to the determination of who should receive reparations. And then the second criteria is, uh, criterion is, uh, is an identity standard. So an individual would have to establish that for at least 12 years before the adoption of a reparations plan or the adoption of a study commission. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, you're saying we don't really need a study commission at this point. But, uh, but whichever came first, an individual would have to demonstrate that they self self classified themselves as Black, Negro, African American, or Afro American. And the reason for including that is to prevent a situation in which people come forward for reparations, declaring that they are black uh, as soon as they hear that there's a real opportunity to get a financial benefit from being black. So that's the 12 year thing. But also there are people who could establish that they have black ancestry or ancestry from somebody who was enslaved in the United States, but they might be living as a white person, especially given the large number of people who passed over from being Negro to white uh, in the first 20 to 30 years of the 20th century. Yes, yes. 
I, uh, I don't think their descendants should receive reparations. That's that's all I'm saying. I, I, I totally get it. I totally get it. <laughs> I, I do. Um, I, I'm just so glad you gave me this, give me this opportunity. Um, two things. One is intergenerational wealth, right? So there's a lot of folks. That, it's like we're in this this time as an economist, Dr. Darity. I know you see it that we have a lot of black folks talking about building wealth. They were on the crypto thing, and now they're, they're um, young brothers and sisters that are engaging in stock purchasing, and it's this whole renaissance of we can make money, we can you know invest in stocks and bonds and these things. Um, as it relates to uh, economics and your, and your discipline, sir, does that make sense? Is that feasible? Are we, are we fooling ourselves that we can somehow uh, level the playing field? By just no, I, I, I don't want to individual? discourage people from trying to accumulate wealth. Okay. But without a foundation in wealth that is consistent with our share of the population, those individual acts of trying to accumulate wealth will not close the racial wealth gap. Okay. So I would never discourage people who have a mind to do this from starting a business or purchasing stocks and bonds or the like. I'd be a little careful about the crypto thing, but that's <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's like the great tulip mania. But, you know, I've, I've gotten in trouble for saying that. But I no, I, I think people should do that, but they should also recognize that without a larger initial wealth base in our community, we cannot autonomously close the racial wealth gap. Dr. Darity said it, folks. Like, look, he's not saying don't don't go be all you can be, but just realize your cousin's still gonna be knocking on your door asking for money until we get this handled. You yeah. may you may be successful, you may be Shaq, but your cousins may not be so lucky. Um, one last thing, Dr. Darity, and, and this is totally gratuitous, man. I'm, there are folks that are saying, back to that point about white folks struggling, there's this guy who does the Dilbert cartoons, who did the Dilbert cartoons. He's the creator of the Dilbert little cartoon thing goes in the newspaper. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was, uh, yeah. I, it was a cartoon I enjoyed. I was yeah, stunned. Yeah, yeah. And we used to, you know, kind of grew up with it in the office place. I used to, yeah, a yeah. long time ago, I, I had a regular job and, um, he he said he did this as a satirical type of thing where he was pointing out that there was a study put out by Rasmussen that said that black folks, um, it was asking, is it okay to be white or something? And that was the statement. Is this, do you agree with this statement? Is it okay to be white? And from that conversation was this, this onslaught of folks saying that white folks are impacted. And I spent a lot of time, Dr. Dirty, trying to tell people that, yeah, there's some black people that may harbor uh, uh, misconceptions about white folks or may have uh, personal, uh, uh, they may have prejudices. That's anybody can have a prejudice or a bias, but black folks don't have the ability to, to to stop you from gaining wealth. You don't have the ability. So as a group, we don't have that type of power. Could you speak to the difference between an individual feeling a certain kind of way and the, the systemic racism and how that impacts people's lives? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that perhaps the most dramatic way in which that affects people's lives is demonstrated by the 100 massacres that were conducted by white terrorists in the United States. There's nothing comparable that Black Americans have ever done. Um, and, you know, maybe you could say it's because it, it maybe you could say Black Americans wanted to do something like that. I, I don't think that's the case. But we never had the capacity to do something like that. And uh, and that kind of unrestrained violence, uh, you know, is is a form of genocide. So your your capacity, your power is very critical in terms of translating certain kinds of attitudes and beliefs into danger for another community. Uh, you know, but there there was something else funny about that question, because I I I think that there's a way in which you could have interpreted that question as asking you whether or not you wanted to be white. Exactly. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to be white. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. And, you know, my, 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 my line is, it's fun to be black, but it ain't easy. There it is. There it is. And that's yeah. that was my thing about the, the poll itself. It was easily to be misinterpreted. Or you can yeah. interpret it different ways. Ways, that's right. That's and, right. And, so. and that's how I saw it. So, uh, yeah, I, it's just a, it's just this victim. You know, they love telling black folks that they're playing victim. That uh, that's another thing I hear a lot, Doctor Darren. Is we are victims. Mm. Yes. <laughs> We're victims of American structural racism. It chokes off our opportunities. It chokes off our talents. And it chokes off our capacity to support our families well. Um, so, yeah, we're victims. And as victims, we warrant compensation for the victimization. Uh, you know, you know, if, if I think for years, women who have been subjected to rape were told to get over it. Mm. Well, that's not particularly therapeutic. Uh, you need some sort of acknowledgement that you have been harmed and you need some form of compensation, even if it cannot restore you to the status that you had before the harm was administered. And so um, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't duck the term victim. We we have been victimized, and as a consequence, we warrant reparations. You know, they uh, the way that they present the idea is not that you are a victim, but you have a victim mentality. Like your your victimization is all up here in uh, your mind. You look at yourself as a victim. Therefore, that's what holds you back. It's not so so racism. so so yeah. So we're not motivated to try to improve. We're not going to go out and try to be entrepreneurs or buy stocks and bonds or get more education where the evidence demonstrates that for any level of income black people do more of that than white people so yeah Bob, and i and i argue mostly by necessity yes <laughs> yeah mostly yeah. by necessity yeah. i know a yeah. lot of folks who, who have started businesses because they just cannot find work so they started businesses yeah. they couldn't get hired so or, or they didn't want to be in a workplace where they were subjected to day in and day out discrimination. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Darity, man, it's it's been a humbling experience to have you here once again. What do you have going on besides tell people about your book and any other events that you'll be uh, that you'll be speaking at? Oh, okay. Uh, now that you tell me, I'm not so sure <laughs> what the agenda is. <laughs> Ms. Mullen has that agenda all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we'll have us on together. And then, you know, yeah. she can she can tell you everything. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But but yeah, the 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 main thing uh right now is that we have the two the two books are out simultaneously. There's a second edition of From Here to Equality that came out with a new preface in 2022 and then there's the edited volume uh from the black uh uh the 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 reparations planning committee commission uh committee rather the reparations planning committee committee and that is from the university of california press and it just came out in may so um mm. uh yeah the black reparations handbook so that that's that's the major thing um Got lots of other kind of research projects going on, but uh, I think that at this moment, obviously, the reparations work is the the most important. Dr. Darity, once again, thank you so much, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule, my brother, and we so appreciate you. Uh, if you need anything at all, if I can help in any way, please let us know. Thank you, Tim. So glad to be on your show. I'm so glad to have you, folks. Dr. Sure. Darity himself, I'm Dr. Darity. Do you have a website? Uh, no, no, okay. I don't. He's actually. on Twitter. <laughs> He's on Twitter. Um, if I am um, on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> look, his retweets do not mean endorsements, though. But he's on Twitter. <laughs> that's his screen name on Twitter. Yeah. Um, that's it, guys. My name is Tim Black. You know where to find me, Tim at TimBlackTV.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. Share this with a friend. Tell him about Dr. Darity and his great work. All right. All right. I'm going to get us out of here.